Hey folks, I just want to let you know about my upcoming book, The Max Coder's Guide to Finding Your Dream Developer Job. If you're looking for a job or you think you might be looking for a job in the future and you're trying to up your mobility and meet new people and things like that, this book walks you through the whole process. So go ahead and check it out. It comes out on November 20th. It'll be on Amazon and you can find it as The Max Coder's Guide to Finding Your Dream Developer Job. Hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of React Native Radio. This week, uh, I'm I'm your panel, I guess, and we have a special guest this week, and that is James Smith. James, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, thanks for having me on the show. Uh, I'm uh, James Smith. I am the co-founder and CEO of a company called Bugsnag, uh, based in San Francisco. My accent is obviously not based in San Francisco, uh, and uh, moved out here about 10 years ago from the UK to join a startup and then uh, started Bugsnag a few years ago. Nice. Uh, yes, thanks for having me on. Yeah, thanks for coming. Um, it's it's always great to meet new people and see what the background is and things like that. And uh, yeah. Infinite Red is a US-based consultancy specializing in React and React Native. They do mobile app and web design and development. They are deeply involved in the React and React Native open source communities, publish the React Native newsletter with 10,000 subscribers, and are involved with the React Native core development. If you have a project and need design or engineering help from an experienced team to take it all the way from concept to completion, get in touch with Infinite Red. You can find them at infinite.red. Make sure to mention you heard about them in this ad. Do you want to just give us kind of a little bit of background on Bugsnag before we dive in? Because I'm always curious, you know, did Bugsnag's one of those companies. There are a lot of different competitors out there. And so it's like, okay, you know, when you got into the space, was it not as crowded? Did you feel like you could do something better? And and where are you going now? Yes, we uh, Bugsnag is is a way to, to figure out if your software is working and when it's not working, what the problem is and how many customers are affected and even are important customers affected. And so there's a long and storied history in this space, as, as you point out. There's uh, back in the day we started off with just logging services like Splunk and, and uh-huh. Sumo Logic. Uh, the natural evolution was some of these trailblazers, especially in the Ruby on Rails space, like um, uh, it used to be called Hoptoad and then rebranded to Airbrake. Yeah. Uh, and Exceptional, if you remember those products. Yeah. And I've used uh, both of them under, uh, under all every, the names. <laughs> I was going to say, every, everybody, everybody used, especially in the Rails space, uh, everybody's played around with these, these, these technologies. And, yeah. and it's way better than digging log files or receiving an email. Which oh, yeah. I, if you remember, do you remember the exception notify gem? Uh, which was anytime an exception happened, it would email you. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then you have a big one. pile of emails in your inbox cause something broke and then it broke again and again and again and again. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I remember genuinely hitting up against uh, Gmail's rate limit at one point yep. uh, by using that product. Uh, so the, the, obviously this is a problem that everybody, uh, cared about, especially in, uh, scripting languages, uh, where, people basically said, we can do better than logs. And we came into the space uh, around 2013, uh, my co-founder Simon and I, and said, you know, these are great, but it feels like they're just scratching the surface, right? The, the kind of leap was back then, let's take these exceptions and group them by root cause. Uh, so let's say this is the same bug uh, because this is the line in the stack trace it originated from. But yeah, it was really focused on Ruby on Rails. JavaScript support was was horrendous. The Android uh, support uh, I actually wrote. So the if you go and look at the um, uh, Airbrake uh, Android library, that's actually code that I wrote back in 2011, nice. 2012. Uh, and so you can tell this was something I've cared about for a long time. Mm-hmm. So yeah. uh, Simon and I basically set out to, to build um, uh, two things. One, full stack. Uh, uh, error reporting and error monitoring. Um, oh, yeah. And, then, and a lot of those didn't do that, right? They'd get exactly, the back end, yeah. but not the front end. Yeah, there's still a lot of just really specialist ones out there, which yeah. are like, yeah, just, just Ruby or just JavaScript or just mobile, like on the uh, Crash Linux uh, on the mobile side of things, just does iOS and Android. So yeah, full stack, and, and that was a day one thing for, thing for us. Uh, but on top of that, um, helping you figure out which bugs to actually fix. So what we found is that this this problem changes at scale. Once you mm-hmm. have uh, a ton of errors and a ton of exceptions, 
or you move on to the client side where it's effectively the wild west your code is running in all of these completely d- distinct <laughs> uh fragmented environments yeah. uh with, it's a discussion with we've had on javascript jabber <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's. Uh, I, I have I genuinely had a talk called JavaScript is the Wild West at one point, and uh, it's you've got Chrome extensions, you've yeah. got IE six, IE eight out there still. Uh, even uh, things like um, uh, security rules. Actually, this is a big thing that comes out when a new browser uh, goes live. Like Safari might just at, at a whim say we've got a new security policy, and it just shuts down. It's all these exceptions yeah. get thrown from existing applications. You've probably seen this. So it's the Wild West. And so the volume of errors is so much higher. So we basically said, well, let's make sure that people figure out which Mm -hmm. bugs matter. Uh, And so the two big differences that we have is full stack and uh, figuring out which bugs matter. And in fact, when should we be fixing bugs at all uh, versus building features, which is this common question in product and engineering management teams. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. So um, we're, we're actually on to talk about, and I think this is kind of a nice lead in. I mean, we, we asked you about your company, but um, you know, we're talking about why apps crash and what developers can do as it pertains to React, and in this case, React Native. And what's really interesting is that, yeah, you know, you've got this tool that all of a sudden gives you this leap forward, right? It's not, oh, I mean, I, I'm, I'll admit, I'm pretty good with grep. I've gotten to be pretty good with grep, but it's totally different than, you know, Clicking on, clicking through to my bug tracking system, right, and going, oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, this this is what went wrong in the last twenty four hours, and getting reports on it. Yeah, there's there's a lot of layers involved in in uh, even just React error monitoring, yeah. not not even getting into the the mobile React Native side of things. The first one is kind of obvious, and that is that there's no production log data uh, once you've deployed your application to clients. The, the logs are just going into their Chrome console if you're doing console.log, for example. And so you need to centralize that somewhere to see what's going on. So you can't grep someone else's uh, console.log. So you need to centralize this stuff. That's step one. And, and hopefully, most people have already done that work or using some kind of centralization technology. But then you start getting into the areas of um, minification and obfuscation. So uh, as a developer, uh, you don't want to see this crash happened in uh, function A, uh, in which is what a minified uh, crash report will tell you. You obviously want to deliver a small JavaScript file to your to your customers in React land. And uh, when a crash report happens, it always says because it squishes them all into one line uh, in a minifier, and it takes all those function names and method names and variable names to just. In fact, some of them use Unicode characters these days, uh, mm-hmm. but just crazy squashed up letters and numbers. So, Oh, the unicorn characters to... are fun. Yeah. <laughs> you, yeah. You get I the box with a question mark in it in some cases, right? It's like, I don't even know what's going on here. Exactly. And and I, I remember looking at some of these minifiers uh, that started using uh, Unicode and minification to uh, even squash the, the, the bundle size down even smaller. And I, I thought there was a bug. I thought there was an issue because I was like, why are there like little tree icons in, in this JavaScript bundle? But yeah, once you've got that minified code, everything's on line one. And so if you're a developer trying to figure out which line did this bug happen on, oh, right. and the minified crash report says every bug is on line one because it's just one giant line with semicolons on it. So you need to do some kind of a de-obfuscation or de-minification uh, to make sense of these crash reports. And so uh, one of these things that uh, I think most uh, JavaScript developers are familiar with these days is, is source maps, the source mapping technology. Mm-hmm. Most people will set source maps up uh, and export source maps from Webpack or their bundler right. so that they can see crash reports in their Chrome console. But uh, tools like Bugsnag actually ingest those source maps as well. Uh, oh, so nice. We can tell you exactly, instead of line one, we can say, mm-hmm. this is a TypeScript file. This is a TypeScript file where this bug happened on line 59 in this mm-hmm. method name on this uh, in this file. So yeah, you want these crash reports to be as close to what you expect to see in development in your IDE, in VS Code, whatever you're right. using, um, as possible. And so that's hard enough in uh, in just JavaScript land. It gets even worse when you get to the mobile side. Okay. So before I start actually contemplating self-harm, um, <laughs> how, how, how do we get around this, right? Because I mean, you know, Bugsnag or tools like it or the Chrome developer console using source maps. I mean, yeah, that's a big step forward. but debugging at least in my experience i've been programming against the web for 13 years you know it's a skill as much as having great tools right 
Um, yeah, the other thing is, is, you know, how, how prolific is this? I mean, in, as, as I was prepping, you know, you sent me a whole bunch of numbers and maybe we should start there and just talk about like what the actual cost is. And then we can come back around to, okay, so how do we, you know, how, how do we solve this and how do we, you know, gain the skills and use these tools? Does that sound like a good flow for you? Yeah, that makes total sense for it. it, it it's a good, uh, the reason that our business exists is that this is a really expensive problem. This isn't something oh, that yeah. is, <clears throat> is just, uh, uh oh, it's going to take me a couple minutes to figure out this bug. It's it's incredibly expensive. And Stripe put out this excellent developer coefficient study uh, earlier this year uh, that speaks really well to this. So um, they they found that uh, uh, developers spend seventeen point three hours a week uh, dealing with bad code. That's quite a broad set of terms, but that will be digging through bad code they don't understand and debugging, and it costs a lot of money. The the the, the Stripe report. Um, uh, talks about the $85 billion of global GDP a, lo- a loss every single year from bad code. And so oh, yeah. for us, that's great news as a company because we're like, look, we built this because I'm a, a software developer by trade and I uh-huh. needed something that would, would help me. And so would, would they, they talk about eating your own dog food. Would, this is something that we built for ourselves. But it turns out this is a very expensive problem. And so, yeah, yep. $85 billion a year in GDP loss from, from, from bugs, basically. One of the other things that, that we find a lot, especially on the client side, most companies that you wouldn't even think of as technology companies, like fast food uh, companies or uh, John Deere, the, the kind of agriculture tractor. I know them for tractors, but they do a lot more than that. They are now a technology first company. Um, and so they've gone from being making tractors to being a tech company overnight. And the point where customers touch your brand is the client side. That's the yep. that's the, the the front and center of your brand these days. And it it hurts when you see software bugs. And on the mobile side of things, another uh, a report that that we uh, we like to talk about is that eighty four percent of customers abandon your application after seeing two crashes. So. If you can catch the 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 bug and, and address it and and, and make mm-hmm. sure it doesn't happen before too many of your customer base see it, that's really going to stop people from churning out. And especially yeah. these days in business, if you're spending a lot of money on marketing to acquire customers, um, yep. or you want to protect your brand, you want to make sure they stick around. Yeah. One other thing, just to uh, add to that, is you know you're talking crashes, right? Which is kind of the the top tier of bad the worst news stuff scenario. that happens, right? Yeah, the worst case scenario. I was looking for that term and I couldn't think of it. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so if it crashes out on them, yeah, after two tries, it's like, well, I'm going to come back later, maybe, and see if it's going to work then. You know, if I'm paying for it, I'll probably try and come back. And if I'm not, I'm just like, I'll find another tool. Um, exactly. But, you know, if it's not working the way that I expect it to, or the way that it always has, right? So there's some update to the code and now it's not working the way that it always has it's not meeting my expectations in some way. I mean, it's still much higher than you would think in the number of people that eventually give up on it. Yeah. And you see this, if you, uh, now we're, we have app stores with public comments on, it's quite a fun thing to do. If you go, uh, <laughs> dig into the comments on app stores and look, look for the rating, the ones that have one star yeah. ratings, you go into the comments and you can see exactly why it's like app crashes, app crashes, or, yeah this design sucks after the update or whatever yeah. it is you, you get this like real time feedback of why people hate your software these yeah, days it's, it's kind of and very public yeah it works but it's impossible to make work in a reasonable way exactly exactly yeah but there's there's all these layers as well you like you yeah. said the crashes are the worst case scenario but then uh there could be user experience issues there could be um handled errors that maybe you know everyone's written that line of code uh, in maybe a try catch statement or a switch statement yep. where you say should never get here uh, in a comment, <laughs> right? Yeah, everyone's done it. I've done it a million times. And yeah. if you're using uh, something like a bug snag, or even if you're still using logging, at least put a log statement in there and at least yeah. say, look, we should never get here, but let's let's tell our dev yeah. team about this. Um, and then there's even other kind of layers in there like performance issues. Um, one thing. Oh we, yeah we worked on earlier this year was adding in um, freeze detection for Android applications. And so we can now detect uh, what's known as ANRs in Android applications uh, and tell you when your customers have seen a locked up application. Now that, that's something that doesn't throw an exception. It just freezes the application. So yeah, there's a, it's crash bugs all the way down. Yeah. And the thing that I think is interesting, you know, going back to the 
app store reviews and things like that is that um, people tend to go write the reviews when they're surprised by something. And so there's a certain baseline level where people are going to get what they expect. And that means that the app works and you're not going to get reviews if you're there. If yeah. you're exceptionally good or if you're exception, you know, if, if people are having hiccups in the way they use the app, then eventually they're going to go write a review and say, this app wasn't worth it. That, yeah. That's where you it, run into. And it's easier to have the bad screw ups than to be exceptional in the good way. hundred percent. It, it's uh I forget what the stat is now, but this most people don't leave reviews. And so yeah. if you're, it's, it's a very much a trailing indicator. If you're seeing people leave one star reviews and, and, and kind of dump in all over your brand on the, on, on the app store, probably that means that thousands, tens of thousands, millions of other people are thinking the same thing, but yeah, you're right. The, the, you'll see, it's very rare that you'll see people coming on and saying, this is amazing. This app changed my life. And I'm almost suspicious when I see those. I'm like, okay, all right, is that the a paid promotion there? Uh, but you can you can pretty much trust when people are saying this is this is buggy, this is crashy, this is didn't yeah. work as I expected. Yeah, yeah. They start talking about the unicorns that came out of their phone. Yeah, you get, you get suspicious, <laughs> but yeah, if if they're having a bad experience and they're exp and they're explaining it in the review, the only issue I really have with reviews is the fact that you can't reach out to those folks. And, and I understand why I think, you know, cause you don't want to, you don't want the app developers, some people, I think most people would, you know, they're, they're good people, but you might get the aggressive person here or there that might want to go and actually push back. And yeah, so I understand I, that, but it would nice to be, be nice to be able to go in and say, Hey, can you just walk me through what you're seeing? And then it's like, Oh, Oh, I know where to fix that. Yeah, it's it's. I've seen now that the Play Store. I'm not sure about the the App Store, but the Play Store has public replies. But there's only so much you can do there. Yeah. You can't share reprodu reproduction cases and private right. data. Um, I mean, that's where tools like like uh, like Bugsnag really shine because yeah. you can actually uh, look up uh, errors and even correlate them by a, a user ID or an email address if if yeah. that data is is being attached into Bugsnag. So you don't even need to ask. Uh, ask your customers to um, give you reproduction cases. Yeah, that, that's the thing that's really nice about a lot of the tools that I've used, you know, like Bugsnag, is yeah, they gather up any bit of context they can give you, right? This is the device it's running on, this is the, you know, if it's a web app browser is running in or the, you know, in this case, it's a phone, it's, you know, you know that it's written in this version of React Native, right? you know, you know and then it, yeah, it just basically says, this is where it failed in the code. Yeah, and, and customers are uh, are really bad at um, uh, sharing uh, why something broke or how it oh, broke. Oh yeah, uh, I've probably been guilty of this myself. But like, you see these these tickets coming in saying it broke, and that's all you yeah. get from the customer. But yeah, the one thing that we we've had for a while in our product is this concept of breadcrumbs, and so not only the diagnostic capture that you get mm -hmm. that's something that we had from day one, but a few years ago, we wanted to emulate effectively a steps to reproduce process. So right. there's not only point in time, crash point in time data that we could capture or exception point in time data we could capture. We now also capture user interactions that led up to a crash. So mm. like on a JavaScript application, this was an Ajax request that went out. On a mobile application, the customer rotated the screen or navigated between uh, Android uh -huh. activities or view controllers and iOS. And that way you can your QA team or your engineering team can say, right, here's literally the steps to reproduce this bug. When I'm building a new product, G2i is the company that I call on to help me find a developer who can build the first version. G2i is a hiring platform run by engineers that matches you with React, React Native, GraphQL, and mobile engineers who you can trust. Whether you are a new company building your first product or an established company that wants additional engineering help, G2i has the talent you need to accomplish your goals. Go to devchat.tv slash G2i to learn more about what G2i has to offer. In my experience, G2i has linked up with experienced developers that can fit my budget, and the G2i staff are friendly and easy to work with. They know how product development works and can help you find the perfect engineer for your stack. Go to devchat.tv slash G2i to learn more about G2i. When you're talking about having customers tell you how to replicate it, I mean, that's really the problem is the customers have no context for what actually matters for you to navigate the code. And so exactly. I'm, I, I worked QA and I worked QA on a very complicated application that had several layers to it. It had a, um, a client for the desktop machine, it had the back end that ran all the stuff. It had the web component that, you know, pulled stuff, the information out. It was, a, it was an online backup 
system. And, uh, you know, when I was doing QA, I mean, I'd run into bugs and I didn't know how to tell the developers where the problem was because right. I didn't understand how certain parts of the back end were architected. I knew what the big pieces did, but that wasn't enough for them to actually narrow it down. And so sometimes, you know, I basically have to have them come sit by me and then, you know, I'm clicking through the interface and they're going, oh, I know where that piece of code is. And so, yeah, yeah to expect your customers to be able to do it is really hard. And so I love that. Yeah, you can essentially give me the story. Okay, pull out your device that looks kind of similar to it and go through it yourself. Instrument it. Oh, all of a sudden, yeah. Yeah, it's it's uh, it, it's difficult to. Yeah, you're right. You can't expect people uh, who are using the application to to know or care about how complicated your your tech stack is behind the scenes. Yeah, it's um, the the closer we can get to the debugging experience that you have when you're on an IDE and you're connected to the device or browser. That's what we want to deliver. Because when you're there, you're, you're, you're in the power position, you're in the, in the hot seat. When this happens out in the wild, it's, it used to be basically impossible to figure this out. And uh, I think we've, we've got to the point now where you can figure it out. Yeah. So yeah, so uh, once, once you have this information, how do you, how do you uh, build into, yeah, how, how, how do you take this information and actually work with it? Like, um, sometimes it gives you the, the line of code or something that you can work from, but you know, how do, how do you build tools up from there? Yeah. I think that one of the harder problems uh, before even getting into the diagnostic data and showing you the line of code that crashed and all the diagnostic data attached to it, I think that probably the hardest thing to do is to figure out who owns these problems and are they a priority and that's tooling and people. I think that, uh, what Bugsnag does is, is we're pretty opinionated about the priority of, of, of issues that we have detected. Because we've grouped them by root cause, we can tell you, well, this one bug happened a million times and affected 500,000 mm -hmm. unique customers. So that's an out-of-the-box opinionated way of looking at things. But not all businesses and not all software is made the same. There's um, some examples I like to uh, point to. There's, there's co companies out there where, uh, like a music streaming service where they have a free offering that's ad-supported and then they have a subscription model. And in that example you're almost certainly going to care more about the subscription customers, the people who are paying you a monthly subscription than you do about the ad supported customers. But maybe you've got a very small dev and QA team. So one of the hard things to do is to make a decision as a team, which bug should we fix first? So what you can do in Bugsnag is you can attach things like this is a paying customer true or false at runtime, and then build a view inside your Bugsnag dashboard and bookmark it that basically says, show me the bugs affecting our paying customers that, that happen the most to least. Um, so having that idea of what matters to you and your business and having a tool in place that helps you figure out which bugs are the most impactful or expensive, I actually think is, is the hardest problem to solve in this space. I also think there's a people problem there, right? If you can have a, you can have, uh, all the tooling in the world, but if your engineering team don't care about this, or if your engineering management team don't prioritize this, or you're in that constant battle between, uh, product and engineering where you're trying to get that hot new feature out. Uh, but you're building piles and piles of technical debts. Uh, mm -hmm. you have to, you have to have something to tie break these decisions. You have to have right. something that's almost a data driven approach to figuring these things out. Yeah. So, so how do you make those decisions? Like what, what do you, what do you weight your decision based on? So I think that one of the things that we recommend is, um, especially when onboarding a new customer or a, a large company typically is we don't just throw them a tool and say, here you go. We say, look, how does this work for you guys right now? How are you solving this problem? Who owns this? And kind of get to know what the ownership structure looks like for, so, for software problems at their company. After we figured that out, I think there's a couple of really powerful tools in the toolbox. One thing that we do, which is um, not very common in, in our industry, in our space, is we provide something that we call the stability score. And right. if you're familiar of, with... Um, uptime metrics and availability metrics. People talk about two nines, three nines, five nines of availability. Uh -huh. That's that's something that's been in the industry for 10, 20 years, but no one's really talking about the nines of stability. And so we introduced this concept where you can look at your application, any app in your stack, let's say it's a JavaScript React app, or it's an Android app, or it's a Ruby on Rails application. And rather than just saying this had X bugs in it, you can look at what we call the stability score, which says, you know, 99 point, 8% uh, of application sessions were crash free. Uh, or on a Ruby on Rails application, for example, you could say uh, your 99.9% .9 of web requests were crash free. It's an apples to apples comparison rather than 
some seasonal chart of crashes that goes up and up and down. And couple that with what we've got in our products. And, and again, this is more a people and process problem than a tech problem. Setting SLOs and SLAs. Um, mm-hmm. You're almost certainly familiar with this, but um, SLAs are really, really common. SLOs aren't so common. So a service level uh, agreement is, is pretty much like we must be above this number. Yes. Uh, and so you can use the data in Bugsnag to say, look, our SLA, uh, and what we call that in, in Bugsnag is critical stability. But our critical stability is, is 99.5%, two nines uh, of stability. And take that and then agree with your product team to say, look, if we go below this, we are pausing on the roadmap. We are going to go back and fix bugs. We're going to do a bug hack. We yeah. fix all these bugs and get it back above that threshold. We also have this concept of um, what we call target stability, which is equivalent mm-hmm. of an SLO, a service level objective. And that's some companies hit that and some kind of companies do great, but that's more of a like a long-term, uh, let's try and aim for this. Um, and maybe that's four nines, five nines of stability. And a lot of our customers, in fact, uh, are using that and hitting those numbers. So yeah, it's always tooling, process, and people. You can't have just one of those. You need yeah. to kind of agree together. But at least if you have a number to rally around, it's a negotiating factor. Product mm-hmm. and engineering can agree of what a goal is for stability. Yeah. And it, it's interesting too. I mean, you know, we, we've kind of talked around some of the people things and some of the the process things. But um, the other thing that I see with process is just having a process. Like when we have a bug reported, you know, knowing right. what to do with it instead of having it sit in bug snag or, you know, whatever else you're using. Cause I know people use all kinds of stuff, but you know, having it sit in your system, and nobody ever even look at it or, you know, assuming that somebody else is going to look at it or, you know, what, whatever, you know, instead it's okay. We're going to, you know, we have this process. So somebody's going to evaluate it. Somebody's going to, you know, explore. Sometimes you don't have to fix it right away, but somebody's yeah. going to make that call. Somebody's going to, you know, be involved. W- what do these processes tend to look like, you know, in the companies that you're talking to that have a successful process? Well, I hundred percent agree with you. First of all, I think that, that a lot of the time, people feel overwhelmed by this and and there's a we, we've had uh we've had people tell us that they've declared bug bankruptcy uh at some points and they've just said right well, there's too many we're going to archive all of our emails or uh, get rid of all our things from bug snag and start again uh from, from that makes zero. them all go away the, your bugs are yeah, gone then, right? <laughs> exactly you get that you get that uh that, that amazing feeling of having inbox zero for a minute uh, for, for but, even if you have a minute <laughs> yeah on a client side application for for a fraction of a second and when before yeah. it all starts coming in um but yeah you're right if you have um it doesn't even have to be like the most thought through process i think that that what we we kind of counsel people who 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 have this problem our customers will say first off have an owner pick an owner um uh, if you don't have an owner you can't really goal these things. You can't really say what your, your processing goals should be. Right. But what we what we typically see is, is there's two approaches. One you've already mentioned, which is quality uh, quality teams. QA or QE is what we're hearing a lot more mm-hmm. these days. Uh, quality teams who have a deeper understanding of code uh, is becoming a lot more common, the QE teams. Their job is to bubble these things up to the people who wrote the code. Now, I actually prefer a different approach. And if people ask us what we recommend, I think that one of the best things about having visibility into to software issues in production is it can help engineering teams get better at their job. Like everyone wants to professionally develop. And let's right. say that you're you're a software engineer and you, um, uh, you I remember this. I when I was a graduate software engineer, I thought the coolest thing in the world was writing um, recursive algorithms or recursive functions, which are, in the real world and in production is is mostly a terrible idea. Uh, and so. I remember causing stack overflow issues all the time because I I was trying to be clever uh, with recursive algorithms. And uh, if I had visibility into that, I could say, oh, I'm I'm making this type of bug all the time. For all you could do things like uh, null pointer exceptions, right? We need to protect our nulls a lot more uh, effectively. And maybe you take that as an individual contributor and say, I'm going to get better at this. Or you take Uh that as an engineering manager and say, let's improve our testing process, right? We're, a new policy is we're going to look at the data that we're seeing in Bugsnag or whatever system you're using and say, let's feed that back into our unit tests and integration tests or, yep. or linting uh, tools or whatever you're using. Um, so I actually think empowering the engineering team to care about bugs that they've uh, mm-hmm. been involved in um, without having a finger pointing or blame culture is the best way to do this. There's, right. there's kind of a third way that we see people doing it as well, which is a, a kind of a middle ground, which I quite like as well which is having um, uh, an engineering rotation 
of someone like a, a bug warrior or Airbnb calls it a bug sheriff, uh, mm-hmm. where you get a badge, you get your sheriff's badge. Oh, nice. week, and, uh, and it's your job this week to raise the flag if there's a problem and to triage and kind of direct who should be working on these issues. Um, so that's kind of a nice middle ground. I think that the QA, QA, QE teams work well, but you don't necessarily get any of that feedback loop and learnings uh, in, in that process. So that's kind of the approaches we see. Yeah, I like that. I really like the idea of just making it one person's responsibility because then there's no confusion, right? So, so your bug sheriff just does the bug sheriff thing. And then, exactly. yeah, everybody you, else you do need, oh, supports sorry, the uh, process you, from there. Yeah. Yeah, you, you, do need, um, you do need a good handover. Like someone, if yeah. it's one person's job all the time, it, it can get a bit uh, repetitive. Uh, I think that the, what yeah. a lot of companies that we work with do is, that, yeah, they'll, they'll hand over the badge once a week uh, yeah. to someone new. But then you need to think about what the workflow is, looks like. Is there a mm-hmm. consistency in the workflow? Um, uh, what happens in the handover? What happens if you got halfway through the triage of a bug and then it's someone else's turn? And so, you know, it, it, again, figuring out how to work with other people on that team is very important. So like Bugsnag and, 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 and some other tools in the space will offer you the ability to assign bugs to people inside of Bugsnag or to comment on a bug and leave, a, leave your uh, trail of uh, research in there uh, or even link it straight into Jira or whatever issue tracker you're using. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 I like that, you know, and, and like you're saying, you know, there has to be a system behind it, right? Yeah. So then it links into Jira, links into whatever, you know, and uh, I'm just big on accountability too, you know, and that's why I like the, the, the sheriff idea and yeah, passing it around or whatever, but you know, it's one's person, one person's responsibility to make sure that it's getting taken care of. They don't have to be the one fixing the bug. They don't have to be the one, you know, triaging or anything. Right. But they're the ones that are looking at it and making sure that it's, brought up on people's radar everything gets assigned out that the process is followed and that's their job yeah like should we care like even if they just say should we care about this book right and that's the question that they're asking uh then then uh, then you go from nothing to something pretty good very quickly yep so i'm curious then um in your experience does uh following a process like this and having a tool like bug snag um you know knowing how to use some of the other debugging tools in your ide or your browser or you know, in your, uh, well, we're talking about native apps, so it's mostly going to be in your IDE or maybe on the command line if you can hook it in or something. But, uh, you know, do, do you see the number of bugs that companies are encountering go start to go down when they start following this? Or do they just manage it better once they happen? I think that at small scale applications, absolutely, yes. The number of bugs goes down. But um, I remember uh, having a conversation with a, a, a potential investor at one point, and they said to me, um, what happens when everyone fixes all their bugs? Uh, you know, how will you make money then? <laughs> That'll never happen. I, you know, I laughed. Just, I was just like, yeah, I mean, that, that, will, that will never happen. I think that really what happens is if you have instrumentation using something like Bugsnag, it allows you to increase your velocity. So no one's going to say, let's aim for, we, ha- we have this on a t-shirt that, that, that we give out. It says, don't, not all bugs are worth fixing. And so no one's going to aim for zero bugs on a client side application. You shouldn't. What people do is they'll say, well, hang on a second. We've got our bugs under control. We've got better visibility. Can we increase our velocity? And obviously, then if you're cutting releases more frequently, once a week, once every two weeks, like on a mobile cycle, mm-hmm. um, you're cutting releases to introduce new features. And every time you introduce new features, there's more lines of code, which introduces more bugs. And so I think it's more of a trade-off between stability and velocity that people end up thinking about. But at least you can be data-driven. At least you can say that that's how we want to tune this uh, slider I, uh, the way i see it from like 100 percent stable to rocket ship speed releases yep very cool now uh some of the bugs that, that i've seen in apps are i guess they come up more in the definition of what a bug is in the sense that you know um if it's an exception that's raised by the program i mean that's obviously a bug right you you put that there to say hey something here happened that we didn't expect right. but what about things like performance or, uh, you know, now we're getting in more, I guess, into the APM territory, right? Where, you know, they're measuring how fast things happen or how responsive things are or, you know, um, how quickly uh, users move from one interface to the next interface. H- how do you approach those kinds of bugs where you're not going to get a report? Hey, the, the program said there was a problem. And instead, you're kind of counting on your user to say there's a problem. Yeah, I think that a lot of those things are are instrumentable. And this is actually something that's, that we're thinking about a lot as a company at the moment. 
you mentioned performance. APM, uh, we we get uh, compared against APM here and there, but most of the time, uh, tools like Bugsnake that focus on on, on stability and application yeah. health sit side by side with a tool like a, a New Relic or an App yeah. Dynamics. Yeah, they're um, solving different problems. That is for sure. Exactly, and and also I think that they've been built with a different audience in mind. They've been built with historically infrastructure operations DevOps yeah. mm-hmm. and sysadmin teams in mind. And most of our customers who are, are running one of the, um, they're great products. Most of our customers are running one of, one of these products. The engineering team don't all have a login to this. There's one or two people who who log into this and look at this, and they tend to focus on averages and aggregates. Um, right. Whereas I think that. In uh, when I think about software health, uh, which is the broader space that, that, that we're in, I think you want things to be actionable. And our audience that we address is software engineers, engineering managers, and right. product managers. And so you want everything to be actionable. So even things like performance, say, I mentioned that we, we detect ANRs in Android. We're not going to tell you your average performance is this. We're going to tell you when your performance was unacceptable, when it went above a particular threshold. And it's quite easy to do in Android's case because the operating system defines that. And so we hook into that. But there's a lot of these other, I think, health metrics that, that contribute to a health scorecard. Uh, and so uh, stability and, and crashes and exceptions, as you said, is obvious and easy. Uh, it's actually, there's a lot of difficult stuff behind the scenes, but it's obvious to, that you, you know that you need to look at them. Performance, I think looking at uh, application freezes uh, mm-hmm. and lockups, but also things like um, cold boot time. Uh, how long did it take from someone clicking on a mobile app, for example, clicking my icon on the home screen uh, to the app being ready to use? Um, a lot of companies that we talk to care about time to first interaction. So how long was it from when I clicked the app icon till someone booked a lift ride, for example? Um, so th- these things I think are, are things that are actionable and that you can measure on a release by release basis. If you've realized that by introducing this cool new feature, that the time average time to book a ride on, on Lyft has gone up from one second to 10 seconds, you know you're in big trouble, there's a problem here. And that's something the product team care about, something the engineering team right. care about. There's a bunch of other layers to this as well, which uh, I think, I'm talking a lot about mobile today, but you right. can imagine how this, this goes across the stack. Like on a mobile application, What's the binary size? It, it, you know, I, yeah. a lot of people, I, I'm an Android user, a lot of people who use um, Android uh, maybe haven't bought a, a large SD card uh, for their phone or they don't have a lot yeah, of fair. storage. And you go into the settings and you can rank the apps by mm-hmm. disk space usage. And w- guess which ones are going to get uninstalled first, the ones that take up the most disk space or writing the most to cache or are right. using the most bandwidth, especially in the developing mm-hmm. world where uh, unlimited plans aren't so prevalent and you get charged a lot based on bandwidth. So there's all of these metrics that you probably should care about on a release per release basis, which also add up to a healthy experience. Yeah, I, I, I can definitely see that. And you know, in the in the case of my applications um, on my phone, I haven't actually released. Uh, I'm I'm working on some mobile stuff, but I haven't released anything yet. But on the mobile phones, um, yeah, you know, I've run out of space on my iPhone. And had to go and look. And yeah, it was always the my podcast app, right? Because it had downloaded a whole bunch of audio files. Was taking all the up content all my space. was on there. Yeah. And so it's it's not just the binary size of your app, right? It's, yeah, it's what else is it putting on the disk or the SD card? In in the iPhone's case, it's a SSD, I think, of some kind. But yeah. Right. You, yeah you, don't, you don't want to be, you don't want to give customers any excuse to think, should I have this? You know, yeah. like that, that, that's the, uh, you got to make the best product you can. You want, you want people to, to, to love and engage with the product, but still uh, sometimes that's the clincher. Oh, this is the app that's taken up all the disk space. So let's just delete it. Uh, yeah. But yeah, there, there's, um, there's some other edge cases as well, like um, uh, memory leaks. Memory leaks aren't quite the same as, as exceptions. Sometimes in some languages yeah. they will throw an exception like in Java, but yeah. on iOS, you just get a, a signal, a, a C-level POSIX signal thrown, and then the app shuts down. So yep. it's not like this line of code caused something. It, it's a different problem. It's the, it's the straw that broke the camel's back, right? It's You allocate some memory, you allocate some memory. It's, it's like uh, playing, uh, have you ever played that game Buckaroo, uh, where you have to add more and more kind of things to a like a donkey? Uh, maybe that's a British thing. Maybe I'm going super British right now. Maybe. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> the, idea, the idea is that... that um, um, the last memory allocation isn't necessarily the thing that caused the, the, the application to run out of memory, to, to be the memory leak. 
It might be that four allocations ago, you allocated a gigabyte of memory, but the last allocation is always the one that gets the blame. So yeah, it's, there's a lot of subtleties here. Yep. One of the biggest pain points that I find as I talk to people about software is deployment. It's really interesting to have the conversations with people where it's, I don't want to deal with Docker. I don't want to deal with Kubernetes. I don't want to deal with setting up servers. I don't, you know, all of these different things. And in a lot of ways, DevOps has gotten a lot easier. And in a lot of ways, DevOps has also kind of embraced a certain amount of culture around applications, the way we build them, the way we deploy them. And I've really felt for a long time that developers need to have the conversations with DevOps or adopt some form of DevOps so that they can take control of what they're doing and really understand when things go to production, what's going on, so that they can help debug the issues and fix the issues and find the issues when they go wrong and help streamline things and make things better and slicker and easier so that they'll more generally go right. So we started a podcast called Adventures in DevOps. And I pulled in one of the hosts from one of my favorite DevOps shows, Nell Shamrell Harrington from The Food Fight Show. And we got things rolling there. And so this is more or less a continuation of The Food Fight Show where we're talking about the things that go into DevOps. So if you're struggling with any of these operational type things, then definitely check out Adventures in DevOps. And you can find it at adventuresindevopspodcast.com. Yeah, it looks like the game Buckaroo is on Amazon, so... There we go. Okay, so it's not just a British thing. Yeah. <laughs> I've been in I've lived in America for over 10 years now and I'm still discovering things when I say something someone will look at me like I'm a I'm an idiot. They're like, "What are you talking? Oh, is that a British thing?" <laughs> yeah, it it looks like it's an older game, but yeah. Oh, that's um, maybe showing my age as well. <laughs> I don't know. I I may be older than you, so. <laughs> anyway, but yeah, it's it's definitely interesting and yeah, you know, um you yeah, you're building up memory and then you have a large memory allocation and then you have four more and that's when you run out. Yeah, and, and this is true. Uh, this is really common in, in apps like, um, if you imagine Instagram, you never, when you're scrolling as fast as you like on Instagram, you never run out of photos and you never see the photos buffering. And that's because they're all pre-allocated in memory behind the scenes. And so if, for example, you forgot to flush those out of memory, the more you scroll down that Instagram page, the more memory uh, gets yeah. allocated to, to saving these images and you're going to crash. Uh, but it might be that, clicking one comment button did a last allocation, but really in reality, it's all of these images in yeah. memory that were causing the memory leak. Yep. Yeah, and those are, those are hard to track down too because They're memory, not Yeah, because it, it deallocates the memory and then you have no way of knowing. There's a really cool um, library uh, that the team at Square built uh, called Leak Canary, and it's designed for Android applications. Oh, and it's wow. not something you run in production. Right. When you're investigating memory leaks, it, it, it gives you a, a profile and, and, and gives you, it's not quite a heap dump, but it will give you insights into where these allocations are happening, where likely memory leaks are. And so at least on the Android side of things, that's a, that's a really cool way to, to, to figure those out on, on the development environment. Yep. Very cool. So um, is there a good place to go? Like if I want to just practice debugging or get better debugging skills? You know, we've talked about kind of organizational things, but, you know, for me as uh, just a regular developer, you know, how do I get better at picking out where the bug is at and things like that? So, yeah, on in development environments uh, where, where you're writing software, uh, I think you just have to write a lot of software because there's yeah. so much variety in these bugs. We always joke around at Bugsnag that we, you know how you have like these capture the flag security competitions and bounty programs that you have. Mm -hmm. uh, we always joke that maybe we should run a, uh, a who, can, who can fix the hardest bug competition so you can get to level 20 or whatever it is. But even that is, is going to be slightly contrived. It's not going to be real life scenarios happening. So there's obvious stuff like, oh, my code isn't even running uh, because I forgot to initialize a variable or, or whatever. But I actually think that the hardest bugs to reproduce and the hardest bugs to fix are the ones that you didn't anticipate and you didn't know what was going on and the environment mm -hmm. differences are maybe a cause. Or things like the data that was loaded from a database for one particular customer was yep. corrupted. And really what you're going to have to do there is, is, is fix and look at real production user-facing bugs. And um, there's no cheat code for this. Like I said, I, I wrote some awful, awful code when I was a graduate. And I, I'm sure my code is still awful these days, but it, you get better every single time. It's a muscle that you have to exercise is, is, is how I look at it. Yeah. 
Yeah. And I agree with you. I was hoping that you had some other tip, right? Some silver bullet for people. (laughs) Well, talking about silver bullets, there was a big push, you know, languages like uh, Swift and I think Kotlin as well, you know, they they realize, hey, nullability is a problem. People are not initializing variables or non-variables are are causing a big deal. So let's build a language feature that helps with that. But people still abuse that. That's the problem. Yep. It's so convenient to, to write code in a particular way. So I think that good, uh, good practice starts before you end up in production as well. So pick languages that help you out, that, that, that have opinions about things like null. Use static analysis, use linting yep. tools, put oh, that as yeah. part of your CI and CD process. Like you're going to capture all the, the, the ridiculous bugs early. And, and, and the good news is that I think that that's, that wave is, is unstoppable. That's, that's happening. Most companies and, yeah. and, and individual developers are doing that. And if you're not going to do it, it doesn't take that long to set up. There's lots of cool tech and tools out there that will help you do that. So, but that just means that the, the bugs that are getting uh, into production are the, the harder to reproduce and harder to fix ones. Uh, yeah. So yeah, you have to do a bit of both. Yeah. If, if people want to check out Bugsnag, we're getting kind of toward the end of the time. Um, where do they go? So uh, we're um, a low friction self-service product, right? If you're a small company or if you're a hobbyist or an individual contributor, kind of you can sign up on bugsnag.com. Uh, we give you a 14 day free trial, but also there's, um, there's a, a, a free plan, which is effectively just volume limited. It costs us a lot of money if you send us a lot of crashes, but mm-hmm. if you don't have that many crashes, you can use Bugsnag for free. Okay. And uh, that, that's typically how most people kick the tires, figure this out. Is this going to work for me? This is, is Like you said earlier, that there used to be a lot of tools in the space. So how do I figure out if this is the one for me, if this is the better one? Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, we like people to just to, to give it a try and kick the tires. Sounds good. All right. The last segment of the show unless there's something else that you feel like we need to address that we haven't talked about. Uh, something that, that um, I think is interesting for the React Native audience is, is, is the deeper layers of, of, of bugs that can happen. We, we uh-huh. talked about the, uh, the, just a React app, you have to think about minification and source mapping. Right. Um, but what we're finding is not everyone is adopting React Native in the I'm building an app from scratch way. They're saying, right. we have an Android and iOS app. Let's retrofit React Native into these apps so we can have some shared components and shared functionality. Um, oh, okay. One of the, and that happens especially with the larger businesses and larger companies that we're working. Mm-hmm. They want the best of both worlds. They have a right. great set of native teams, uh, Android and iOS developers, but they want to maybe have a shared settings page or right. um, a shared feed or something like that. In there. And, uh, the number of problems can go wrong in a layered app like that is 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 kind of ridiculous. You've got uh, the JavaScript layer, and then you have to do the source mapping to map those JavaScript errors back to something you recognize. Then you've got the iOS and Android layers. Uh, Android layer, you've got the JVM layer, so you've got Java bugs. Uh, right. Maybe you're using ProGuard to to obfuscate and strip down the binary as well. So you need to deobfuscate that. And then a lot of people are also using the NDK, the C, uh, C and C++ layer of, of writing Android applications. So in an Android application, you can have three layers of, uh, of bugs that can happen, that all look completely different in completely different programming languages that all are uh, completely obfuscated. Same is true on iOS. You've got the JavaScript layer and React Native. Uh, then you've got the Cocoa layer. And then maybe you're just writing some... Um, uh, pure C and C++ under the hood. So I think one of the things that is a bit of a struggle for React Native developers in particular is if you are writing C and C++ code or Java code or Swift code, you need to be a jack of all trades. You need to be an expert in all those layers. And you also need to find, uh, work out how to do debugging in each one of those layers as well and, and make sure that all the minification work is happening. And so I always find that as a, as a, as a challenging thing because in the React Native world, well, Expo, I think, does a better job of, of, of selling this dream of write once, deploy everywhere. But in, in the React Native world, that's, I think, what a lot of people expect. But in reality, you still have Android code running under the hood. You still have uh, iOS code running under the hood. So it's not quite the utopia of um, you only need to write JavaScript code uh, that, that some people think it is. Yeah, that makes sense. It's, it's, it's an aspect that I guess I hadn't really thought about. But yeah, you could have shared components written in React Native that go into them. Um, a native app. And I've also seen it done the other way, right? Where you pull native components into a React native app. And yeah, so I'm, I'm decent at JavaScript and debugging JavaScript and I don't have a good foundation in Swift or in Java. So 
now what, right? This, this happened exactly. in this black box. How do, how do I track that down? Yeah, or, or um, I think when React Native first became popular, uh, people would be like, great, that means we can pull across our front-end developers to work on this mobile application. But then the yeah, that turned out to team, not. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but but that you can, if you're doing shared components or streams, you can yeah. get a lot of that benefit. But yeah. a lot of the time, those front-end developers, the JavaScript uh, uh, developers, don't sit in the same office as the mobile team. Yeah. But you need to collaborate. There's no like tossing over the fence. You have to work together. You have to learn a little bit about each side. So yeah, it comes back to the people and process problems again. But yeah, uh, I think you just have to respect that there's code running in each layer um, and and uh, and understand that when you're when you're rolling out these applications. Yep. Yeah. Hundred yeah, percent. Yeah. I mean, I think React Native, back to the other point, made it more approachable for front end devs. But it, yeah, it definitely didn't make it so that it was just a seamless transition. Right. And Expo does a better job there, I think. Yeah. But the, on the other hand, yeah, I also like, like the point that you made where essentially you said it's back to the people and process problems. What I find is that probably 90% of the issues you can trace back to um, people and processes. Yeah. And, and companies, especially startups, tend to be running a million miles an hour. Yeah. And process is always something you think, let's, let's sort this out later. Let's solve this later but it has this compounding effect. If you don't even make basic process decisions early on, it gets harder and harder with time and scale to make those decisions later. And you have more tech debt to clean up and more politics to deal with later on. So yeah, uh, just stopping and slowing down every now and then and saying, what are we doing a good job of and what are we not doing a good job of and how are we going to adjust that process and policy and ownership and accountability, like you said earlier, I think it has a, has a compounding effect. Yeah. All right. Well, um, if people want to find you online, like you specifically, are you on Twitter, GitHub, places like that? I'm on, uh, I'm on, I'm on Twitter and GitHub, and my handle is Loopj L O O P J. I am super not active on social media. Um, I'm <laughs> having a bit of a, I'm having a bit of a, a social media vacation at the moment. Um, I'm also not super active these days coding. I used to spend all my time uh, outside of work writing open source software and open source libraries in particular. And uh, two things happened. I decided to start a company uh, mm-hmm. and then I decided to start a family. Uh, and so that's eaten, in, <laughs> eaten, into, uh, eaten into my open source time quite a bit. Uh, but yeah, I'm Loop J uh, pretty much everywhere. Nice. Yeah, I understand both of those have been running this company for <laughs> what? Uh, we've been doing the podcast. I've been podcasting for 11 years and I've been consulting or whatever for eight. Anyway, and then... Um, yeah, the the other end of it, have family. Yeah, I have five kids, so I get that too. Well, yeah, so yeah, um, it's, quite, it's quite the juggling act. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, all right. Well, let's go ahead and uh, do some picks, and I'll go ahead and go first. So I've got a couple of picks. Uh, the first one is is that um, this week or this next week, as we record this, I'm I'm releasing my first book. It is the Max Coder's Guide to Develop or Finding Your Dream Developer Job. Um, is for the people who are either looking for more job mobility. So they're afraid that they might lose their job or think they might want to move on. I specifically, though, read it, wrote it for new developers coming in. And uh, it just kind of goes against the traditional wisdom of write your resume, send it to as many places as you can, hope they call you in for an interview, hope the interview goes well, and then they give you a job offer. And instead, what it does is it walks you through, okay, figure out what you want, where you want to end up. Um, and then also figure out what things matter to you, salary, benefits, you know, vacation time. I mean, everybody's in a different place. And so, it, it, you know, coworker, boss, you know, some people, they're good as long as their boss is good, right? So anyway, figure out what that is for you and then go find companies that match up with that. Get to know people that work at the company and then, you know, kind of work through the people that you get to know, that you get to build a relationship with to wind up working with them, right? So you get to be friends with the kind the kind of people you want to work with and you go work with them. So that that's the approach in the book. And it's going to be on Amazon on November 20th. So, and I'm pretty sure this comes out either the day before or right after. So anyway, should be out there by the time this goes live. And then a couple other picks. I've been picking Christmas movies on all the other shows. I'm going to do it here too. I'm going to pick the same ones that I picked over there. So if you listen to the other shows, sorry, repeats. But yeah, it's it's the Christmas season. I've been kind of looking for that that happy, uplifting stuff, right? And so uh, one of my favorite movies is It's a Wonderful Life. Um, it's got James Dean, or James Dean. <laughs> I really am tired. Uh, James Stewart and uh, Donna Reed. Anyway, it's it's a classic movie. I really, really love it. 
And so uh, I'm going to pick that one. The other movie that I'm going to pick also has James Stewart in it. Um, it's about 35 to 40 years older than It's a Wonderful Life. So he's he's a uh, kind of an old old man in this movie. It's called Mr. Kruger's Christmas. And uh, it's much less well known, but uh, he's this custodian that lives in the basement of the building that he takes care of. And he's he's a lonely guy. And so you see him kind of have these flashbacks and daydreams and things of, you know, what Christmas is. And, you know, you realize that he's, yeah, that he's lonely and that he's looking for, you know, kind of that ideal of Christmas. And uh, anyway, it's, it's a terrific movie. It's about an hour long and I really, really love it. So those are my picks. Uh, do you have some things you want to shout out about James? Uh, I guess uh, I, I've got to do a bit of self-promotion for uh, uh, DroidCon, which is coming up on the 25th and 26th of uh, November uh, in San Francisco. Um, it's my favorite conference of the year. My, I come from the, the Android community and, mm -hmm. and, and I don't get to code that much anymore, but I still love going to that conference. Um, so I'll be there both days. And I think Bugsnag has got a, a booth presence there as well. If you want to come and say hey, to, hi to the Bugsnag team. So that's uh, 25th and 26th of November, Monday, Tuesday. Uh, completely outside of that, though, one thing I'm quite obsessed about at the moment is um, the Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening on, on the Switch. I'm not sure if you've played this, but uh, I, it's I want fantastic. To. It's, I played it when I was a kid on the Game Boy. I had one of those beefy, beefy Game Boys uh, in black and white, and I hadn't played it since, so how, however long that ago was, 20, 20, 25 years ago. And I got it on the Switch, and my two-year-old daughter sits next to me on the couch and and nice. uh, watches me play. It's just oh, so it's, it's more fun than I remember it being. Yep, yeah, I had a Game Boy back in the day. I think I played Ocarina of Time on the Game Boy, but yeah, awesome. yeah, stuff. I think that was um that was on the N, that was on the N sixty four. That oh, was that one on was, the N sixty four. Yeah, that was uh that was one. That's one of the best. That's yeah. one of the greats. Yep, yeah, I really like Breath of the Wild too, but uh, yeah. Anyway, good stuff. All right. Well, thanks for coming, James. Uh, this has been really fun to just chat, and get to know you a little bit and, and uh, you know, put information out there for people to realize, hey, we do need to be paying attention to our bugs and here's how we get the information we need to, to track them down and fix them. Awesome. Yeah, thanks for having me on the show. I appreciate it. Yep. All right, folks. We'll have another show out for you next week. And in the meantime, Max out. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com to learn more.